So if you knew that a family member or a friend was coming to stay with you for a few days, would you do anything to prepare? Um, if you knew you were getting a promotion at work and it required some new responsibilities and maybe even a new space for you to work from, would you do anything to prepare? Um, if you knew that you were getting married in the next six months, would you do anything to prepare? If you were going to have a baby in the next few months, would you do anything to prepare? And the answer is, of course we would. We all know it would be foolish not to prepare for some really good things that are coming into our life. You want to be ready, not only to enjoy, but to make the most of the good things that are coming into our lives. So we would probably clean our house a little bit, tidy up, get some things together so that we could welcome someone who's coming. We would do some research on maybe what the new job required of us so that we could feel equipped and prepared to step into it. We, we might make some plans for our weddings. Uh, those things do not plan themselves. And so we probably participate in that. And, and I've known some people to, to even take steps to make sure that that's the best they've ever looked in their life on that day, which is why so many pictures are taken at weddings. And, and then uh, uh, if, if you were having a baby, you would probably set up a little room, maybe set up a crib, do some things to get ready for that child. Something good is about to happen, and we want to be prepared for it. That's the way God thinks about a word that we often misunderstand and misinterpret, and it's the word repentance. You probably have seen someone uh, who has had a sign and was screaming at the top of their lungs, repent, the end is near. If you've been to a Bills game, there's a guy that stands out there, and, and, and my assumption is he's not just talking about our season. I, th I think he's talking about more than that. And, and, so, and basic messages, things are about to get really, really bad, so you better clean up your act. And is that a picture of repentance? And really, it's an inadequate and incomplete picture of repentance. It's more a picture of survival and self-preservation. Something bad's about to happen, and, and you want to eliminate as much of that bad as you possibly can from your own life. There's other people, when they think about repentance, they think it's all about regret and remorse, about how bad you feel. And uh, every single one of us have said something or failed to say something, done something or failed to do something that we regret. And depending on how much pressure came into our life and how many people we hurt, we probably have some pretty strong emotions attached to that. And so the question is, can you repent without feeling bad about something? Like, if you repent and, and does God look at you and say, well, you just don't feel bad enough about that. That doesn't count. How do you know when you've repented enough? What's acceptable to God? And these are things that we have to think about because the scripture talks a lot about this concept of repentance. And for a lot of people, they're not really repenting. They're just embarrassed that something got found out about them. They, they, they're worried about how that they will look. They're, they don't want to deal with the consequences that come from an action or an inaction that they've taken. They're, they're, they're very concerned. Who's going to know about this? Is that repentance? Is that repentance? So... I think sometimes people assume that they're repenting when they're really just trying to get out from underneath a problem and make themselves look a little bit better. At the end of the day, the thing we have to repent of the most is our own self-centeredness. We just want life to revolve around us. There are ideas that we have about how life should work and one of the fascinating things is once you've met Jesus, how those ideas begin to change. We all have different ideas. So repentance is the way, repentance is the way we experience God 
when it comes to forgiveness and it comes to guidance. Repentance is the way we experience God when it comes to forgiveness and guidance. So let's look at a passage of scripture. It's found in Matthew 4. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Isn't this interesting? Jesus is not saying, repent, because the end is near. He's saying, repent, because a new beginning is near. It's a very different way to think about something. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their boat and uh, father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering with severe pain, the, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across Jordan followed him. Uh, there, there's a person that uh, Matthew identifies in the preceding chapter as kind of the predecessor of Jesus, and, and it's John the Baptizer. And John the Baptizer, uh, he was made for YouTube TV. Uh, he, would be, he would go viral, absolutely. He, he was a firebrand of an individual. He dressed kind of funny. He, he wore a camel's hair and, uh, and, a, and a leather belt, and he ate locusts, which are not particularly delicious, so he would dip them in honey to get them down. And uh, this, is, this is a person that could make it on, on YouTube. And, and he had one message, and, and the message was exactly the one Jesus picked up. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. What's interesting is that it's very easy to assume that it's our repentance that makes the kingdom come. And so you need to repent so God's kingdom can come. But that's not what John was saying, and that's not what Jesus was saying. What they were saying is, it's not your repentance that makes the kingdom come. It's your repentance that prepares you for when God's kingdom comes. So repentance is this idea of turning. I, I heard someone say this. They said, repentance is, is turning around 360 degrees. That, is, that, that means you're going in the same direction you were just a minute ago, right? That, say, turning around is, 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 is 180 degrees. This is not repentance. Repentance is turning towards God. And a lot of people focus on what Others should be turning away from. And Jesus and John just focused on what people should be turning towards. And the reason is because there are some things that look really good in our lives. And we put a lot of stock in making sure people notice that we're doing those things. And yet we are not following God. We're trying to make a name for ourselves. The natural human tendency is just to justify ourselves when we get something wrong. Other people would have done the same thing, we might tell ourselves, or other people are doing the same thing or even worse. And here's the thing about repentance. Repentance is not denying our faults or excusing our faults. If you have a good reason for what you did, you don't need to repent. How many have eaten in the last week? More of you have eaten in the last week than that. <laughs> You don't have to repent for eating. Some of us have to repent for what we ate, <laughs> but not the same thing. Repentance is a way to turn around and to go towards God. And there's, there's two basic ways that human beings have of seeking their own way, their own desires, their, their own agenda in life. And the most common that is and the easiest to identify is the people who just say, I'm not going to let anybody else tell me how to live my life. 
I'm not going to follow somebody else's rules. They're not my God. They're not in charge of me. I'm going to do life on my terms. I will decide what's right and wrong for me. A lot of people in this tribe. And so they, they head out and they chart their own course. And when they do something, that's, that's what they want to do. What's fascinating, I think, is when someone does that to them, how they feel about it. So we all kind of look at someone like that and say, yep, those people need to repent. Give me a sign. And, but there's another way that we try to take control of our lives, and that is not by creating our own, our own moral code, but by keeping a moral code. And some of us are good rule keepers. Some of us are just better at it than others. If you're a firstborn, you're probably a better rule keeper than other people around you. I was the firstborn of five. I've got a little rule keeping something inside of me. And I, I, I will try, I, I have bugged a lot of people. I have. So, and, and this is what we'll say. Yeah, that's what God is looking for. He's looking for the rule keepers. The question is, why are we keeping the rules? And this is what's true. A lot of us are keeping the rules so that God will be obligated to give us the life we actually want. See, we're still trying to get our life. We're just using God to get it. So I want to have a good job. I want to have a good education. I want to have a good spouse. I want to have a good family. I want to have a healthy body. So I will keep the rules and God better give it to me. And when something goes wrong, people will be frustrated by that. And they'll even say things like this. So what's the use of following God? Oh, dear friend, that is not the language of following God. That's the language of using God. I kept my end of the bargain. You better keep your end of the bargain. And what scripture reveals to us is whether you're just charting your own moral code or keeping one, we can use both of those options to try to be in control of our lives. We are trying to be the boss of us and sometimes the boss of other people. So um, a lot of people, when they talk about repentance, they'll talk about what you're turning from. Jesus talks about what you're turning towards. And Jesus gives us two very powerful pictures of what he means by repentance. What does he mean by repentance? So back to that verse, four, uh, verse 18. It says, as Jesus was standing beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew, and they were casting in into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come and follow me, Jesus said. I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. And then there's another example of, of John and James. To be a disciple of Jesus is to be a follower of Jesus. To be a disciple of Jesus is to be a follower of Jesus. It's not just to be interested in Jesus. It's not just agreeing with something that Jesus said. It's not just repeating, reciting, or remembering what Jesus said. It's following Jesus. And following Jesus is not like following somebody on social media. I follow a lot of people on social media. I don't actually follow them. Jesus said, follow me. Some of us are in rooms like this, but we're not following Jesus. We're trying to get Jesus to follow us. Okay, Jesus, this is what I want. Make sure it happens. And that's not what discipleship is. It's not what repentance is. The gospel, the good news, is not that your kingdom is near. The gospel is that God's kingdom is near. He's the one who's in charge. That's why God calls everyone to repent. The rule breakers, the rule makers, and the rule keepers. Everybody has to repent. And this is what's fascinating, is he doesn't do it. I know I'm going to get flack about this. So He doesn't do it to prove he's right. 
though he is right. The reason he calls people to repent is not to prove that he's right. The reason he calls people to repent is so that they can be included in the kingdom. He doesn't want anybody to miss out. He even told Peter, here, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. If someone gives you the keys to their house or someone gives you the keys to their car, they're telling you something. You have access. You are welcome. And this is why God calls us to repent. It's not trying to prove someone is right and someone is wrong. It's trying to prove it's, he's trying to invite everyone to be a part of what he is doing in our world today. The kingdom of heaven is near. And Jesus did not come to build our kingdom. He has come to build his kingdom. So God's kingdom enters our world by entering our hearts. That's where it starts. It doesn't happen in an election. It doesn't happen in, in all the things that we can try to set up, organize, subsidize, all of those things. It starts right here in our hearts. And this is what we need to know. God could easily override anyone's will. God could do that. You've probably done it. Oh, we all have different strategies. Some of us will power up and get loud. Some of us will cry. Some of us will give the silent treatment. We all know what we're doing. There's something that we want. We're not getting it. And I'm going to use this strategy until I do. And God gave us free will. You get to choose. Now, if I were God, I would not have done it that way. But there is a very long line of people who are glad I am not God. And he doesn't override your free will. He makes an invitation. That's how it works. He's not going to force you to do something against your will. This world is filled full of lesser kings and lesser kingdoms, and God is not intimidated by a single one of them. He doesn't have to force anyone to do anything. He just makes an invitation, and his kingdom goes forward with the people who say yes to his invitation. That's really good news for all of us. So God doesn't override. Jesus did not come into our world to complete a to-do list and to set up a syllabus. Check, check, okay, the blind person healed, got it. Fed the multitude, got it. Lame person healed, got it. Sermon on the Mount, finished, good to go. Not what he did. Jesus came to make disciples. He's looking for people who will help him in making disciples. And Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, and what does he do? He calls people to follow him, not just watch him, not just agree with him, not just like him, not just repeat him, but to follow him. And he tells them, if you will follow me, I will use you to help other people follow me. Now, some, if, if you're here, well, does that mean I need to quit my job? It does not mean that you need to quit your job to follow Jesus. There are people that are all around us that Jesus would love to invite into his kingdom. And you can be that light, that truth, that peace, that grace, right where you are. But we have to decide whose agenda we're after. Are you wanting God to fulfill your agenda? And is that your definition of his kingdom? And that can be a real problem. The second picture is a picture of healing. This is what it said in Matthew 4, beginning in verse 24. News about Jesus spread all over Syria. People brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain. If you've ever experienced severe pain, you know how debilitating it can be. Um, so people with severe pain, people who were demon-possessed, those having seizures. There, there are some people who think that in the ancient world, if anyone had a seizure, they were just considered possessed, but 
That's not what the scripture says, is it? There, there, were, there were two different kinds. There were people who had seizures and there were people who were possessed and, 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 and then there were those who were paralyzed and he healed them. He healed them. In God's kingdom, people who suffer find relief. That's very good news. Those who are driven by demons are freed. That's very good news. People who have seizures are healed. That's really good news. People who are paralyzed can walk and move. That's very good news. And you're probably sitting here going, ah, I don't know how that pertains to me. It's an amazing picture of what God's kingdom is like. Our world is filled with suffering and it's not all physical. There are people right in this room right now and you don't know how many more days you can get through. And I have good news for you. The kingdom of heaven is near. There's relief available for the suffering you're going through. There are people, our, our contemporary culture uses this language. They have their own demons to fight. Isn't it interesting they still use those words? And there are people who find themselves acting out in ways, it's almost like a seizure, it's a reaction. It's, it's not how they thought about it. They've even told themselves they won't do it anymore, but it just happens. And, and, and they're, acting, they're acting in ways that they don't seem to be able to control. And then there are other people that when it comes to speaking up, standing up, doing something, they seem completely paralyzed. They lose their voice, their muscles stiffen. They, they, they can't step into a situation and do anything. Our world is very much in need of the kingdom of heaven drawing near. And Jesus says, if you are going through situations in your life where you can't speak up or stand up or you find yourself acting in ways you wish you hadn't or you find yourself addicted to things that you can't control or you find yourself in extreme pain, good news for you. The kingdom of heaven is near. Is that not good news? That's good news. Let's bring the, the worship team up. One of the things we do around here is we anoint with oil sometimes when we pray for the sick. Why do we do that? There's nothing magic about the oil. Why, why do we do that? And the answer is, is that in the ancient world, it was a sign that you were being set apart for something. So if someone was about to become king, they would pour oil on their head. If they were about to become a priest, they would pour oil on their head. If they were about to become a prophet, they would pour oil on their head. And it was a way of saying this person's life is actually going to be in service to God. They're not pursuing their own agenda anymore. God's called them to do this. And so sometimes when we're physically sick, disabled, in pain, we anoint with oil. <laughs> Why? Because we're saying the kingdom of heaven is near and God has a purpose for this person. And this illness, this sickness, this pain should not be deciding what they can or can't do. The kingdom of heaven is near. Um, I have a, a number of flaws in my personality. Uh, one of them is uh, I, I like a sad movie. I just, I'm bored with movies where everything works out for everybody. And, uh, but boy, if there's a lot of heartache and tragedy and pain and sorrow, the perfect movie is when everybody dies. That's <laughs> <laughs> It's not exactly true. Some of you have done the math. You've plotted your course. You've used your experience and you've plotted where you are and you figured out where this is heading and the ending is not good for you. The difference between sad endings and new beginnings 
is repentance. It's coming to God and saying, I'm not going to try to be in charge of my life. As best as I can, I'm going to follow you. Even when it makes me uncomfortable, even when it's something I would prefer not to do, I've decided I'm not in charge of me anymore. I'm going to put you in charge. And what I will tell you is, that is as big a deal for religious people as it is for non-religious people. There's a lot of people who are very good at being in rooms like this and keeping all the rules. And the reason they're doing it is so God owes them. And repentance is, I don't, God doesn't owe me anything. He's already given me more than I deserve. He gave me his son and his son gave his life and all of my faults and failures are forever forgiven. And I'm going to stop trying to run my life because the kingdom of heaven is near. And I'd much rather see what God can do with my life than what I can do with my life. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, would you help us step aside in trying to control our life and trust you, your kingdom is near. We want to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.